Good afternoon. Thanks for hanging around for the last talk of the day. I know it's been a long couple of days. Um, so I'm the project officer for a large heritage mapping project that's based out of the New Forest in the UK. And I just wanted to present today a few of the things we've been doing uh, to engage um, the general public with the LiDAR data which we've acquired as part of this heritage mapping project and share some of the multi-sensory approaches we might take. I've even brought, brought a few of the bits with me so you can get hands on some of them if you want to. So the New Forest was designated as a national park in 2006. It's one of 15 national parks in the United Kingdom and it's located on the south coast there. Uh, it's actually one of the smallest national parks in the UK. Um, but it was designated as a national park but due to its um, really diverse landscape cover. And it's got actually one of the largest areas, lowland heathland in Europe. Um, we got hugely diverse uh, landscape coverage ranging from heathlands. Um, yeah. um, he, a heathlands, ancient woodlands, commercial woodlands, coastal flats. Um, and it's also um, highly recognised due to its historic value. So in 1079, William the Conqueror, who um, became King of England in 1060, came and took over England in 1066, created the new forest or the Forest of Nova as his very own uh, royal hunting forest. And this saw the mo movement of people off of certain areas of land. Um, it saw the creation of a huge common, um, what's now known as the open forest or the open crown land. Um, where you see your traditional New Forest ponies walking around today. And these diverse landscapes and this creation of the, um, the Royal Hunting Forest created really a fantastic time capsule in terms of archaeological sites because we see very little pressures on the archaeology, whether that's from uh, intensive farming or commercial development. There's really, other than during the Second World War, there's been very little impact. So we have fantastically well-preserved archaeological sites ranging from the Bronze Age all the way up to the Second World War and everything in between. In 2010, uh, the open forest where you get the ponies and the cows and the donkeys wandering around entered into Europe's largest higher level stewardship scheme. And it's in its most basic form, this is a land management scheme or an agri-environment scheme. Uh, and this is due to a number of reasons, but predominantly due to this lowland heath heathland, um, a fantastic triple SI. And uh, this is a 10 year scheme which saw, it sees um, about 20 million pounds worth of funding over a series of projects um, ranging from wildlife conservation um, and commoning uh, practices. Um, but the largest of these is the wetland restoration schemes. And in the 19th century, uh, a number of the wetland uh, watercourses in the New Forest saw canalisation take place whereby the, the land managers came along and went this this area isn't very good for the, the commoning livestock. There's very little grass for them to graze on. What we'll do is, I don't know if it's a laser pointer. Yeah. What we'll do, we'll, we'll shove a lovely long straight watercourse through here and cut off this big meandering stream which is flooding and causing bad grazing conditions. What we'll do, we'll get all the water off the land and cut and then improve the grazing. But this has, a huge, this has had a huge detrimental impact on the habitat, certain habitats found within the lowland heathlands. So as part of the high level stewardship scheme, we, we're taking under, undertaking a huge amount of work of reinstating these old meanders, you can see here, and backfilling this watercourse. Um, and that, that's the biggest aspect of the new forest high level stewardship scheme. Um, but it was identified that there's going to be a huge impact on any archaeological sites uh, located within these, these areas. We have one of the largest densities of burnt, Bronze Age burnt mound sites out of Ireland in the New Forest. Um, on this site, we have a medieval hunting lodge just here, which has been cut by the watercourse. And there are a number of other archaeological sites in and around these watercourses. And before the project started, there were only 1,000 archaeological sites recorded in the local historic and records office. So it was deemed that this wasn't an accurate, this was not an accurate rep representation of the number of archaeological sites here. And we needed a quick and rapid way of identity, identify, identifying any archaeological sites that might be damaged by these wetland restoration works. So we see diggers and low loaders and whatnot coming in 
and bringing in lots of materials and disturbing the ground. So, uh, what we did was commission in 2011 a remote ser sensing um, survey. Uh, this was flown in February and we gathered air LIDAR uh, data, 3D LIDAR data, aerial photography and uh, inf near infrared imagery. And it's safe to say we got quite a lot of data. Now, this is at 50 centimetre resolution and within this we then had the data processed using slope analysis, hill shade, principal component analysis, aspect analysis, DTM, DSMs, the work, the full works. And it's proved fantastically um, powerful. We've, we're halfway through now, we've got around 3,000 sites that we've recorded, so we've more than trebled um, to what, that which was recorded previously. Um, and we're finding some really nice sites hidden beneath the trees in the forest, because we are a forest, the LIDAR gives us that functionality of being able to penetrate the tree canopy um, through the gaps. And we're picking up features like this lovely uh, Iron Age enclosure, possibly a banjo enclosure um, that wasn't previously known. And then just over here, beneath the trees, we have a series of Second World War um, military installations, um, as well as some Anglo-Saxon ploughing, which is going north to south, north of there. A lovely Iron Age enclosure here, possibly earlier, and some lovely Bronze Age barrels over here. It, it's been amazing. And uh, as I say, we found 3,000 sites. We've covered about 10,000 hectares. Um, the sites that we've identified within there, we've, we've identified over 40 sites that need restoration and improvement undertaken. And we, we've had that work undertaken, whether that's removal of gorse from prehistoric barrows or um, a, a bit of pointing on a um, Boer War observation hut. So it, in terms of managing and protecting our archaeology, it's been really good. And what we wanted to do in 2015 was to mark the midway point of this 10-year scheme, share some of the successes and um, engage the public with what, what we found and what, what the project was all about. And what we particularly were interested in doing was engaging a, a particular age group that we, we, we felt don't really engage with archaeology, and that's from about 12 up to the age of 25. So unless, unless they're doing history and archaeology at school and college and university, we have this, from a national park point of view, we have this whole um, age group that that aren't interested. Young kids love it. Uh, older older p generations are fascinated by it. We, we, we haven't been able to engage the younger generation. So we were, we were deliberately targeting this exhibition at the younger generation. And we wanted to have a very high level in, of engagement and interaction. But what we also wanted them to do is to understand that LIDAR is more than just these lovely pictures that they see. And they go, oh, wow, what's that? What do the colors represent? Um, is that height? No, it's not. Um, but also to understand there's 3D data behind that information and how it, what it ori origi originated it from, how it was recorded, what the process was taken, what process was taken to create that lovely hill shape principle component image. Um, and it, as I say, so aspects of how the data was recorded, actually in its most basic form, it's a lovely text file full of easings, northings, elevations and uh, intensity information and then before we get to that lovely hill shade image we need to create a, um, a digital terrain model um, and then process that out. Um, the one, press, one processing technique we were quite keen to put across because it seemed to be the image that most people were interested in was hill shade and how using different light sources we can identify um, different features within a particular area, why we don't rely on one hill shade, we do multiple hill shades and then put that through a pr principal component to make sure we have all the information on that image. So we went about three different approaches. The first was um, trying to help people understand the data behind the pretty pictures, um, creating DTMs, 3D models, 3D prints so people could get hands on with and understand that th this information is has 3D data behind it. It's not just a flat raster image. Um, we also then looked at getting people to interpret the data for themselves, not just to accept that there are squares or circles or lumps and bumps in the data. They, re the, they actually represent something and um, what, what perhaps those, those lumps and bumps might represent. Um, and finally, um, 
what those sites might have actually been and how they might have looked um, when they were in use. So whether that's a prehistoric burial mound um, or a Second World War airfield, they're looking at the use of virtual reconstructions to and the LIDAR data within that to bring that, those sites to life. So the first approach we looked at was the 3D printing and that was, uh, this was linked through Harry Manley and Gary Underwood at um, Bournemouth University. Um, we went through a process of converting the LiDAR data from points to raster DTM to an OBJ, creating a solid model within the computer software and then printing that out. Um, and we picked four sites uh, of interest to engage the public. The first of which was the Second World War Boeing Range, which uh, Ashley Walk, which has a lovely plateau along the top. It's quite a flat area. There are very discrete features from, um, from concentric chalk bombing rings um, and uh, bomb craters, which you can see just here. But it also has a very sharp escarpment along the side. And it, it, so it, the terrain itself changes quite dramatically. Um, the second one we chose was Judy Airfield. So we have a section here of the, um, the, the boundary uh, track around Bewley Airfield and the runway coming in from the east here um, and a number of Bronze Age round barrows and the Second World War um, Boeing target. And again, this, the reason we chose this area, although it's not wooded, um, it's a very flat area and you'll get to see that in a second. And we wanted to show people that um, even very flat area, very small undulations, we can pick up archaeological features. The third site was this medieval hunting lodge due to its location on a prominent hill point. And also this is a very heavily forested woodland to help people understand that we can see these sorts of features underneath the trees. And the final one was this Iron Age, this lovely Iron Age hill fort at Buckland Rings, where we've seen some ploughing take place. Um, and the area itself is predominantly covered by trees. So there are the four sites. The other thing that I failed to mention as well, the Ashley Walk site here on the left. Um, in terms of mapping data, if people were to walk out into the New Forest today, they might get an idea that there's something going on here. But in terms of the rest of the features around it, they, they might not have an idea. So give them an idea, there's a lot more out there than perhaps the current modern maps show. And as I said, we've got heavy woodland over a number of these sites. So this is where there's a bit of hands on. So once we 3D printed the, uh, the sites, um, we came out with some lovely um, plastic um, prints, um, varying scales and sizes. And we wanted to get people to get hands on and get tactile and realize that there was, this was a 3D image. Um, it's effectively a digital terrain model, but not digital, it's a physical. Um, and we wanted to help them understand about point clouds as well, so we started using the classic 80s, 90s uh, toys of, yeah, I'm sure you would have put your faces in these, but to help people put them over the 3D data and get hands on and understand that each point represents an east things and north things and an elevation, and by recording those points we can start to then create digital terrain models and then process that data. So I'll pass that. Yeah, as I say, help people understand there's actually points in information behind those points. Um, next thing we want to do is help people understand about the processing of the data, the processing of that terrain model and why we how we create the shadows and why we use principal component analysis to bring those inf that, that information together because we might lose information if we use one light source. So uh, we, designed, we designed and commissioned a bespoke case, which you can see on the left here, which has four light sources. You can turn a switch, it changes that light source and brings up different shades, shadows within that thing. So again, I've brought another one of the prints here how to uh, how to how we did that and these pre these prove really useful a really engaging way of teaching people about processing the lidar getting hands on and feeling and learning about the processing the computer processing behind the pretty pictures once we covered those areas we wanted to look at how people understood the lidar data 
and we, we purchased a um, Idiom 46 inch multi-touch table um, which dual boots both uh, Windows 7 and Android um, and we purchased a copy of um, Omnitap's uh, software. The um, reason behind that is because it's got m many, many different applications within one and we could use lots of different, uh, we are using them in different scenarios. The one we used within this was allowed people to bring in images and digitize them effectively. So um, one of the main ones we, we used, you've seen this one already, Beauty Airfield. Um, they were provided with this image. They were given a, um, a key to say, if you think it's a bank, use a red line. If you think it's a ditch, use a blue line. If you think it's an extraction pit or a cut, use a green line. And we were getting, I mean, this is a particularly good one. I believe it's probably my colleague, but um, we were getting some good interpretations. So again, people could sit there and do a bit of armchair archaeology and try and interpret the LiDAR data for themselves. And, once they'd done that, they could click on a button and compare how, what they'd done with our interpretation of the data, see, see what we'd missed and what they'd missed. The final approach we took was the use of virtual reconstructions. Um, and again, this was a link through Bournemouth University, Dr. David John. And um, the idea behind this was showing that we can do more with the data rather than just um, create hillshade slope aspects raster images, um, as great as they are for prospection, we can do, do more and we can try and interpret or try and show what those sites were for their just archaeological remains that we see today. And we provided um, a series of undergraduate students with the, um, digi the digital terrain data um, from our LIDAR data. Um, we provided them with um, just raster images um, with the height information um, and they used these, these, these data as their base data to recreate a number of the archaeological sites in, found in, this, in the data. So this is one of the nicer examples. This is East Boulder um, Flying School, um, dates from the late 1800s, second flying school in the United Kingdom, fifth in the world, um, and it was reused as a First World War airfield. Um, today, if you look at LIDAR, it's not the best picture, but you can see a series of small rectangular foundations but unless you knew the, the history behind that site and you knew what that was, um, you might dismiss that as just a series of small rectangular features, particularly if you weren't, you weren't trained within LiDAR interpretation. So uh, we, we encourage the students to take on a number of these sites that we'd identify within the data, use the height data as their base model, and then do historical research um, to gain accurate models of con uh, constructions. Um, I should say they're computer game students, they're not archaeologists. So some of them, we had a big varied um, result. Some of them were fairly poor, some of them were fairly good. This East Boulder one worked out really well, um, to the point where he'd done his research to find that uh, one of the first World War airplanes had crashed into the local post office. And as a bit of an Easter egg, he put a crash plane into the local post office. Um, and he'd done historical research into location maps as well, so the buildings are in the right place. The tents you see are from a particular period. There's a historic aerial photograph that shows the tents in there. Um, and as part of the research they were doing, on top of this, we were looking at how people were engaging with um, virtual reconstructions. So we produced um, copies of these interactive models um, within, tap on, within Unreal Engines, and we put these on, on tablet devices, on iPads, and people could explore the models for themselves in the exhibition. And we also had a session where they could come and try the Oculus Rift and explore it fully submersively. And we, we were gaining feedback, and we hope to publish a paper on that at a later date. Um, another aspect of it we, we were looking at was the use of geo-locating um, information. So one student took the LiDAR data um, and also took the intensity data of uh, Rock One Roman Villa, uh, which is located in the north of the forest. And he went and visited the site, which is the museum today. He found out about each individual building and then added geolocation tags to the model. So as you walked around the model, information boards come up and tell you about appropriate um, information for each building. He also reconstructed particular um, 
artifacts that were found in the area. Um, he had added water effects in the steam room. He has steam coming out of the walls, you'll see here. Um, and it, it's meant to be as submersive as possible and have as much going on as possible. So there's a real, um, he, this student was particularly good. Uh, you see it's a fairly crude model, but in terms of the result, it was very good. When you went down into the underfloor heating, there was crackling of the fire. Um, you could walk into this, this place. And um, he, he'd really got the bug for this particular site and he'd done all his historic research. Um, and I, I think he's done a pretty good job there. So, that one. Don't want a video of a donkey. It's a donkey come on. No. Bit of propaganda for you. So that, that worked really well. And we, we had, um, as I say, we used the Oculus for a particular event and people were exploring these sites um, with the, the iPads. Um, we did add a, do a few other activities on top of that. So we, um, we embedded a virtual AR tour within the entire exhibition using Erasmus. Um, and we created a, um, a questionnaire where children could use their own tablet devices. Um, they had to find clues within the questionnaire and then write down what animation came up when pointing at uh, particular images in the, um, in the exhibition. So again, it was about getting the, the children in and reading and learning about the exhibition pieces rather than just accepting that there's lots of nice images everywhere. So you can see a child there, he's looking at some First World War training trenches that are in Matley. Um, that were reused as a dog training school and when he held his iPad, iPad up to the image of the dogs it came up with beware of the dog. Um, we also used um, Quiver or what was formerly Colour AR um, where children could colour in and design their own LiDAR plane and then pointing their uh, uh, mobile devices or tablet devices at that, that image it would reproduce an animated version of that LiDAR plane with the exact colours and images that they've drawn on that picture. And we also ran a Minecraft competition. So we, we encouraged children to recreate um, archeological sites found within the New Forest, identified in the LiDAR data um, within Minecraft. And with some, some support from Ordnance Survey, we, we ran a competition and uh, provided some prizes for the best, um, the best entries. So in review, the, the exhibition itself ran over four months and we had just under 20,000 visitors um, as part of that, we did a digital archaeology weekend where we had the Minecraft competition and other activities and 800 people came along to that particular event. And we had hugely positive feedback about the interactivity, interactive nature of the exhibition, um, the hands-on, the, um, the, the different approach to just providing information. It was about getting stuck in and learning about the LIDAR and the archaeology and the heritage of the New Forest. Um, we, it was also a really useful educational tool. So we, we did a number of school visits uh, where we took the, uh, the touch table with us and the, the, the children were able to do some LiDAR interpretation uh, in their classroom. We also took the 3D prints to um, a number of schools with, vis with visually impaired students and students with learning disabilities. And it really helped us to teach them and for them to comp comprehend this certain aspects of um, archaeology and LiDAR that perhaps traditional approaches to teaching archaeology um, couldn't or didn't. And we're able to reuse a number of the items we, we, we created and um, during the exhibition. Um, lovely positive feedback from this lady. The only slight criticism is she talks, she talks about lovely laser mapping images, which wasn't, I don't, it's not about the images, it's about the yeah, three prints and the other bits, but, but she was very kind. I'll just leave you with one final slide, it's slightly off the wall and slightly less relevant, but we, we've recently had an artist in residence in Lymington. Um, if you go on our website, you can find a bit more Alice Agnes. Um, and she actually took our LiDAR data and created a silk dress out of it. Um, and I include it predominantly because just down here, she included Hearst Castle, which is, uh, which created, the central bit was created by Henry VIII. It's got two very large Second World War wings attached to it now. But um, she saw the LiDAR as slightly more than, well, it looks pretty, I suppose, but she, she, she saw it as 
and she was looking slightly more from a natural environment point of view, but she, she looked into it a bit further and wanted to include it within this piece of artwork she'd done. And just to say thank you to the Verderers of the New Forests who fund my post and funded the exhibition um, Ordnance Survey for providing a series um, of prizes and support and um, support over the exhibition and all the other partner organisations that we work with during the exhibition. Thank you.